how did I come to hip hop? Wow. Um, high school? Okay, there's two versions for me. At a girl's house, not supposed to be there. Obviously, you want to catch our nonsense with her. And her father pulls in the driveway. And she goes, my dad's going to kill you. And she has a brother who's younger than her. And she calls him and says, I'm going to give you 20 bucks if you say it's here for you. He gives me a cassette. So the dad walks in, I go home with the cassette. Never heard this music before. Wild Wild West, Cool Mo D, Nightmare on Adam Street, Fresh Prison, Jazzy Jeff, uh, My Philosophy, Curtis One, I Need Love, But I Still Tell. Um, but the interesting thing was that obviously my brother got detained that same year because he was involved in the, what was called then BAMCO. It was Pontival Acadia and Waterdump, BAM, the community project, but it was high school kids from the SRCs. So he was involved in, I don't want to say the NC Youth League, but you know, the Youth League of the party he was mad about. So he got detained, and a lot of the stories that I just heard him talk about, you know, the whole white and black thing, was kind of similar in the music that was on this cassette. I wasn't exposed to it because I kind of grew up in a church setup. And it was just interesting because dad and mom loved music, and a lot of the music they were listening to now, snippets of those music came through on this cassette that this friend of mine, who's not really my friend, gave me, you know, this girl that I had to think for. Um, but fast forward, high school, and that was first year of high school, so a guy in my class called Paul, never saw him at the base, nickname was Ozone, because he was like a, kind of a b-boy in his own right, but he was writing raps in the classroom, I started messing with it, and someone at school said, hey, you kind of good at this, 5 FM now, back then called Radio 5, has a competition with this chips company called Willards, and a thousand rands up for grabs. I'm from Pontypool, a thousand rand sounds good. Wrote 12 lines, because I didn't know about 16 bars or anything like that. I wrote 12 lines, and a week later, my aunt nearly had a heart attack, called our house and said, Tyrant's verse is on the radio. A guy called TSA is going to rap it now. They're talking to Alex J on the radio. And I was like, what? So obviously, I go to the library two days later, and there's a guy with a Steven Seagal haircut. Got a baseball bat in his hand, broken jeans with graffiti on it. They call him Dopey T or Mr. Fat. And he says, are you the lady that won the competition? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and apparently the group was called the Yo Boys or something like that, which is not Yo as in just because of rapping. It was like gangster dudes that he was friends with. And he just said, but you know, I own Bon Tivo when it comes to the hip hop scene. And I was like, oh my God, what am I involved in now? So yeah, he just said, look, um, it's cool, um, if you want to meet the dudes that was on the radio, I've got connections with them. Meet me at this dude's house, which is Marsh and Birch's house. They had a crew called Jambi. Went to their house, obviously did triple somersaults because they had a Dr. Rhythm drum machine, which I've never seen in my life before. Marsh was in the process of buying the old S50, which most of the POC stuff was produced on. So even just seeing some guy do that, because all I knew up until that point was writing rhymes and performing it over someone else's beats, you know, or even taking cassette and making your own little uh, looping the four bar intro of a song. So when this dude said we'll make beats for you for like 50 rand and 100 rand and wash and I was like cool. Then when I went to Mitchell's Square and I met this dude called Lady D, he was making better beats for me, sampling, you know, the people I was listening to. Yeah, that was kind of the thing for me. Um, again, also very active in my youth and my church thing, so I think as a as an IT, very much saying I'm rapping for Jesus, which didn't make sense, but I was saying yeah, I'm rapping for Jesus or whatever. But these dudes were cool. Like Marshall was cool, Lady D was cool, and um, he made some beats for us. And yeah, I think that was kind of my my entry into it. And because myself and Fat kind of had a vibe, I think it also had to do with a girl at my school that Fat liked, and I had, you know, knew I could look him up. <laughs> so I think I became like his favorite dude. And then, I can't remember ever paying when I went to the base because Fat was there because people just assumed I was like his brother or whatever. Um, and then, like I said, being responsible for like three people because the church I was in had like a mentorship program and these kids that was under my watch, I was like, you guys want to see these sinners that we're trying to reach for the Lord? Come on, thank you to <laughs> the Short Market Street number 88. That's where they gather. <laughs> That's where we're going to go is practice what we preach. So we did that. Uh, watched Malcolm X at the base, watched Deep Cover at the base, met a lot of people there, and yeah, I, I mean, think that's that's the hip hop as I know it. That's what made me fall in love with the culture, where the people had connections from overseas and war, 
the brand names, you know, that I could recognize from MEO MTV raps or from music videos that I saw at the base nowhere else, you know. The first time I saw international rap group in a magazine was Public Enemy in a Time magazine, because I was a bit of a nerd at school first. But it was just cool that a lot of the information I didn't get at school, I got through rap music. Farrakhan, uh, Fidel Castro, stuff like that. And some of those things were unlocked for me and made clear to me via verses in someone's rap. And sometimes it wasn't made clear, but they made a reference to it and I wanted to understand who the hell is Mario Andretti? Why would an MC say, you know, Lurithi Mario Andretti? Or why would someone say control like Fidel Castro or whatever? So for me, that was just something that blew my mind. End of high school, 1983, big year for South Africa. Province of the city, because they're now in the circle of friends I move with. Mr. Fat says, would you like them to come to your school? And I say, hell yes. They come to my school, they give me a shout out over the mics. I'm the most famous dude, obviously, at school getting lots of digits from all the honeys at school. Um, and then Ali, the guy who was with them, and Berger, the driver, said, you can go with us, we're going to UC, uh, UWC after this to take the equipment away. And I'm in the van with POC now, it's like, cool. But then I saw the AD do like a type of three, four minute DJ demo. And it was just insane. Because he was taking old records and even just new hip hop stuff. And I knew, okay, this is something that I want to do. Um, so, yeah, for like three or four years, messed around as an MC, I want to say, or as a rapper, not an MC. Um, just, you know, messing around with poetry and putting it to some other, on someone's beats. But then in 93 is when I kind of fell in love with that element of DJing and I saw D. Um, exposed to other DJs, but just, you know, people that play music at weddings and someone's backyard for a party. But that's how I got into it. And here we are, the rest is, like I say, not easily, but still DJing now.